spaces and, and work to do. So good yeah. morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon to those joining from elsewhere in the world. Um, it's a pleasure to have you join us again in 2021 for our series of Monty Hart Lectures. And today we have uh, a real Jedi master, like I like to call mm -hmm. him, Tava. He's one of the people I really respect and I've learned so much from. And we all continue to learn from you, Didier. So Didier Cheche from um, Pasteur Clinic Toulouse, he's going to tell us about his golden tips and tricks. I can't wait. Thanks, Didier. So thank you very much, Azim. It's a, it's a true pleasure to be here with you and to be able to see your face and all these friends. And um, the, uh, the purpose of this uh, lecture is more about uh, uh, sharing practical, practical steps, practical moves, uh, tips and tricks that we use in our daily practice just to make sure that we still streamline transfemoral TAVI procedures. Uh, so it's a kind of basis uh, just to stimulate uh, discussion at the end. So feel free to ask any kind of uh, uh, comments. Uh, we will uh, try all together to address your uh, your comments. So, so I think it's time to uh, to start. So it wasn't so easy to uh, to pick up ten golden uh, tips and tricks uh, for Tavi, uh, but I tried to uh, illustrate the most uh, popular one, the most frequent ones that we uh, that we use here in uh, in Toulouse. Here are my uh, my disclosure. So just to uh, introduce our institution for, for those who uh, don't know, uh, Toulouse is in the southwestern part of France. Uh, so I have the great privilege to work, to collaborate with my partner, Nicolas Dumontel. And so as a team here, we all the structural heart disease team. We, we did last year more than 800 uh, TAVI uh, procedures. And, uh, more than 90% of these uh, procedures being transfemoral. So the, the focus of this talk will, will be about tips and tricks uh, about transfemoral uh, uh, transcaptor aortic valve implantation. So the overall, uh, the um, a very generic idea is to try to keep it simple as usual, as, uh, as far as you can, try to uh, minimize the number of people, try to do the procedures as fast as you can, because the faster you are, the safer it, it seems to be for the patient, less uh, risk of thrombus, complications, and so on. So uh, streamlining is really important and it's the core of our uh, uh, patient handling in, uh, in Toulouse, trying to be as uh, efficient as possible. So uh, basically, we are two operators at the table, one nurse, scrub nurse, just to prepare the valve, one uh, circulating nurse, uh, just to uh, make sure that the patient is uh, stable and then we can get everything that we need. And we have an anesthesiologist that is uh, available that prepares the patient just at the start of the procedure, conscious sedation with local anesthesia, and make sure that uh, we can have uh, everything needed if the patient has a, a blood pressure drop or something like that. But we try to keep it very minimalistic and very uh, simple. Uh, so first uh, tip, uh, first trick. So uh, sorry for that. So the first trick is all about the uh, the radial access. Uh, I do believe that uh, getting a radial access for uh, as a, uh, an accessory site is quite important, but because as you can see, uh, almost um, one third of the vascular complication that have been reported so far in the literature occur at the uh, accessory site. So moving from the femoral to the uh, radial artery uh, makes sense in the contemporary practice. And I would uh, uh, really stress that I go uh, for radio. You can uh, use uh, the material that you use for the peripheral uh, procedures. It works for the radial access, but you have to get uh, familiar with that and to be able to, uh, to achieve your procedures. The echo-guided puncture. Echo-guided echo puncture has, has become a central piece of the, uh, the procedure because as you understood and as you see on the daily practice, if you secure the uh, vascular access enclosure, you're going to achieve most of the, uh, the success of the procedure because Complications that you see are vascular complications. We have to make sure that we prevent them. And moving from uh, echo guide, from fluoro guided to echo guided puncture makes sense. And I wanted to uh, to share a couple of tr uh, tricks with that. The first one is if you want to increase the uh, visibility of the, the needle, what you can do is to generate some stripes uh, on the surface of the needle using a, a scalpel. Using a blade, you can uh, uh, really scratch the the outer surface of the needle, and this is going to make it thicker on echo, and it's going to be more uh, visible. Uh, 
a very important uh, aspect of the, the puncture, if you uh, do that, if you do the echo guided puncture, is to try to uh, remain uh, parallel uh, to the echo beam when you uh, to the echo beam and when you do the puncture, because you want to make sure that you see the entire needle from the tip uh, to the, the bottom part to the more uh, proximal part. So it has to remain parallel uh, to uh, the echo probe, and this is very important. So uh, what we do usually is to keep the, everything uh, in a more uh, anatomical way. That is to say that the skin of the patient is at uh, 12 o'clock. You have the femoral head at six o'clock. You have the uh, proximal part of the vessel with the external iliac that points at nine o'clock. And then you have the femoral bifurcation at uh, three o'clock. And that is the general representation, generally what we use. That way you're gonna see your needle coming exactly in the, in the right from the right, uh, done the same aside as your right hand when you're doing the puncture. So uh, even when you do the one trick that is really important for the comfort of the patient, when you do the local anesthesia, to really try to uh, to get the adventitia of the patient, the patient. And you can see that clearly. If you see the needle, you can uh, put a very minimal amount of lidocaine from the adventitia to the substantial tract and then the skin of the patient. And this is going to really target focus the anesthesia and really increase the, uh, com the comfort of the patient. Once again, that important trick, uh, keep it parallel to the echo uh, probe. If you wanna uh, bring everything more medial, bring the entire needle medial, uh, bringing, tracking, dragging the tissue with you or lateral depending on the, uh, the location of the, co the common terminal artery, but try to avoid to be off axis as compared to the uh, echo probe because you won't be able to see the entire needle. So the, uh, uh, the general uh, technique, the general trick is to try once you get the uh, uh, the common femoral artery really visible, you can see that sometimes you can clearly identify the uh, the, the posterior plaques on the vessel. Really try to keep the needle uh, parallel to the echo probe, to the echo beam. Then you do a tenting on the vessel. And clearly, uh, the vessel is really is quite thick, so you can really apply some pressure on the vessel without entering with any conventional needle. And clearly, you can decide where you're going to enter and how you're going to enter. So. Now, uh, what I do is to remain in that view, long axis view. And if I want to have the maximal diameter of the vessel, I am quite sure to be central as compared to the anterior wall of the vessel. And I do my uh, puncture exactly uh, that way on top of the common femoral head with a nice tenting, verticalize the needle and then uh, enter. But sometimes if you want to make it a little bit more, uh, more safe, what you can do is keep the denting, rotate counterclockwise the probe, a little bit of cranial caudal angulation to identify the needle, and then you can enter. So very, very simple tricks, just to make sure that you can safely and properly access, uh, get access to the common femoral artery. A very important uh, trick, and this is something that I've learned from one of my friends, Kintaro uh, Ayashida from Japan, when I was proctoring for, uh, it was maybe uh, six, uh, six or seven years uh, uh, ago, uh, what it taught me was to remove the, the slack uh, from the pro glide. Once you've deployed your pro glide, you keep both hands of the, uh, the string parallel and you pull on everything. And this is going to bring the overall knot in contact with the common femoral artery, the anterior wall. And sometimes in a very uh, uh, thin patients, you may even see the knot outside the skin. And this really tells you that the knot is, con is in contact with the anterior wall of the common femoral artery. And this has dramatically improved the overall efficiency of closure at the end. And this is really one trick that made the difference for our ability to uh, uh, safely uh, close the vessel at the end of the procedure. So remove the slack, very simple step, don't forget that. So uh, one of the um, discussion that we have sometimes is do we have to go for a, a parallel probe light technique, yes or not, or use the uh, two o'clock, 10 o'clock uh, technique. I have to say that it doesn't really make any uh, difference. The only thing is that the parallel technique is really useful when you are a, facing a posterior plaque that is really protruding in the lumen of the vessel. That way, when you're gonna enter with your proglide, you're gonna see that it's almost impossible to retrieve uh, the anchor and to get into contact with the uh, uh, anterior wall of the common femoral artery. So you just have to rotate, uh, just uh, so as you find a suitable put a spot that uh, 
brings you away from that posterior plaque. And once you have that and you can bring back the, the, the anchor in contact with the CFA, you just keep that orientation. You're going to put the first proglide, pull it more lateral or medial, depending on the way you want to start with. And the second one is going to be deployed exactly with the same orientation, but in the opposite part, in the uh, contralateral part of the vessel, medial or lateral, depending on uh, the way you started with. So the parallel progress is really useful when you are stuck and when you are facing an, an extremely protruding posterior plaque on the uh, common terminal artery. Uh, so uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, when you are facing tortuous uh, vessels, what you can use is the, the body wire technique, bringing a second stiff wire that is going to uh, straighten uh, most of the vessels and uh, make sure that you got a, a kind of rail that is going to help you uh, track uh, through the uh, common terminal heart with the iliac and the abdominal heart. Huh? And what we do in Toulouse is to use the same access body uh, wire technique. So. It's very simple. The idea is to bring two, for example, two short lendocris wires just to make sure that you're going to uh, bring the, uh, the, the shape of the delivery uh, catheter. So what you do is you do your puncture, you uh, bring your progly, you uh, deploy your proglides for the, the pre-closure. Then uh, on a regular wire, you bring a nine French shape, something that is quite flexible and going to adapt uh, to the uh, tortuosities. And within that slightly larger shift, you're going to put both lender, both lendoquists. You withdraw, withdraw the shift, and one of the lendoquists is going to be the rail for the big, uh, for the large bore shift, and the other one is going to be the support and the uh, the wire that is going to straighten everything. So you can use the same access body wire. It keeps it simple and it provides you the ability to still use the radial access as the accessory site and to uh, prevent the risk of uh, uh, vascular complications from the femoral, contralateral femoral access. So very simple trick, very uh, easy to achieve, very simple steps. So you know that the, uh, now we, we may, depending on the device that we're going to use, we may uh, use for the angiographic angle projection, either the free cusp view or the, the cusp overlap view. If you work with the free cast view, depending on the device, what we uh, recommend is to, uh, to use the follow the right cast rule. That is to say that in LAO, you just try uh, to um, identify, to pull apart the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp, put it into the middle, the right coronary cusp, and you just follow it. If it appears a little bit higher on the screen as compared to, uh, to the other, uh, leaflets over cusps. So what you do is just you go, you move cranial at the CM, and that is going to bring a little bit lower uh, the uh, uh, right coronary cusp. And you do the opposite. If it appears to be lower than the over cusp, you bring the CM caudal that is going to lift the right coronary cusp. So it's very easy. Follow the right cusp. And this is a standard rule. Uh, one trick that I wanted to uh, share with you about um, how to cross, how to cross, and uh, everyone has his uh, technique. And this is a trick that I, I, um, I've taken from one of my mentor, Alec Vanyan, when I was a, a fellow in, uh, in Bisha. So he just uh, taught me how to put a kind of small angle on the distal two centimeters of the wire. You put a, a 30 to 45 degrees angulation, and this is going to provide you natural movement of the implants left one catheter all around the valve. And if you need to be a little bit even more off axis as compared to the axis of the, the valve to map various uh, a different aspect of the valve, you just have to extrude uh, more than 10 centi two centimeters of the wire. If you are between zero and uh, two centimeters, you're going to have a straight wire. If you extrude uh, these uh, distal two centimeters, you're going to have that 30 additional 30 to 45 degrees of uh, uh, maneuverability of the wire. And this is uh, the kind of uh, movement that you uh, you may observe naturally without rotating the, the antlats left one. You can see that only by extruding the wire this is going to map quite naturally the surface of the valve. So that's what we, that's uh, what I, I do when I, I teach my, my fellow. Because that's extremely useful. And then you can uh, usually use the regular technique that we all uh, know. The first technique uh, to cross the valve is the uh, pecking technique, but you can use the sliding technique when it, it becomes a little bit uh, trickier 
to uh, to cross the valve. Rather than pecking, you just bend the wire on, on the top of the leaflets and you do some push pull movements at the same time rotating clockwise clockwise the implant's left one. And if you do so, as you can see on that animation, you just push pull the wire on top of the leaflets small rotation gentle rotation clockwise of the implants left one and this can make it easier for you uh, to, to cross the valve when, be, when it becomes uh, it's it's difficult so the first technique is the pecking technique as we all do mapping from below the left main the left coronary cusp uh, till uh, the non-coronary cusp if it doesn't work that uh, sliding technique uh, may be useful Last trick, use a hydrophilic wire, like uh, as for example, the, uh, the Remo uh, straight uh, stiff wire that may be useful. It has to be uh, utilized in a very uh, cautious way because it can perforate the left ventricle or uh, probe the coronary artery. So you may use it, but start with these techniques uh, when it becomes uh, difficult before uh, moving to the, uh, uh, the Remo stiff straight wire. So just an example of the pecking uh, movement, that is the, the regular uh, one. So that's uh, what you, you do. One hand uh, is going to just push uh, the wire back and forth. The other one is going to rotate clockwise, counterclockwise, push for the amplats left one. And if you add that uh, 30 degrees angle on the wire, it's going to be uh, very, very useful uh, to cross. So for the... Um, um, for the wire, the stiff wire that is going to be put into the left uh, ventricle, my favorite wire is the, the uh, um, Boston Safari uh, small curve. That is uh, the, the, the curve that I use for every kind of uh, patient, except if the left ventricle is really dilated, I use the large curve, or extremely small and hypertrophic dynamic, I use the extra small curve. But the, for the vast majority of the patient, it's the uh, Safari small. So, you can use it uh, uh, using the uh, uh, Amplats left one catheter that has been used to cross the valve. You just keep the Amplats left one two positions available, either in the mid cavity with the tip pointing upwards, and the uh, Safari is going by itself uh, to find the, the apex, or you can put the uh, Safari, the uh, Amplats left one in contact with the apex, match, matching the shape of the left ventricle, and this is going to help you uh, to extrude safely uh, the uh, uh, safari a uh, small curve. So if you want to make it safe, use a pigtail, but know that it's uh, extremely feasible, easily feasible with an amplats left one. If you follow that rule, keeping the tip of the uh, amplats left one pointing upwards. But sometimes we have to uh, to shape manually shape our wire our wires, and that's what uh, we did all in the past. Uh, uh, Juan uh, Azim, we uh, we used to do that. And uh, if you uh, see these shapes, you can clearly identify that the safari has been um, uh, shaped uh, based on these curves that we used to do in the past all together when we didn't have any uh, uh, curved wires. So you you have to know how to do it. Sometimes we don't have a, a pre curved wire, so it's really easy to do it. Uh, first, uh, uh, using a syringe that is going to provide with, with the, a rough curve on the, uh, the, the, the distal portion uh, of the, the wire. And then by using your, uh, your fingers, your fingers are going to provide you with some more homogeneous uh, bend on the wire, avoiding uh, kinks that may be harmful for the left ventricle. So first start with a syringe and then you can use your thumb and your index thumb of the right hand, index of the left hand. And if you use both in, in uh, coordination, the curved uh, portion of your fingers are going to shape the wire and to avoid any kinks and keep it safe. And you can match the curve of a regular uh, safari, safari wire. And this was uh, done with uh, an Amplatz uh, super stiff wire, but you can do it with uh, other wires as well. So I would not use uh, hemostats because it's really easier to uh, really easy to generate kinks. I would use either something that is round like a syringe or your thumb, your, your fingers. It's more, uh, it's softer uh, for the, the wire. So uh, wire wise, what is uh, extremely popular and this is going to be my uh, part of my ninth uh, tips and tricks. Um, it's uh, how to stimulate, uh, use the left ventricle for uh, left ventricle wire for LV stimulation. So you can use it. There are very simple rules. The first thing is that you, the wire needs to be into uh, contact with the left ventricle 
Um, any part of the left ventricle, it's not necessarily the apex. Sometimes um, for those who are using, for example, the Evolute or the Portico uh, platforms, you need to withdraw the wire before the final release. You key, as far as you keep the wire in contact with the left ventricle, whether it be in the mid cavity or the apex, avoiding some, some scar, uh, ridge, scarred region of the left ventricle, you're going to have a, a good uh, contact, so a good simulation of the left ventricle. First rule, contact with the muscle. The second rule is that you need to have an insulator on top of the, uh, the, the wire just to make sure that the energy provided by the generator is going to be, uh, is going to reach uh, the left ventricle. So it has to be done either with a balloon catheter, the, uh, diagnostic or a guiding catheter, or the uh, delivery system, delivery catheter of the valve, the prosthesis. If you want to pace with the left ventricle wire, you have to have something that is going to isolate the uh, wire with the blood from the blood. So the uh, uh, over very important uh, um, message concerning the left ventricle wire stimulation, you need to provide enough energy to the left ventricle if you want uh, your stimulation to be accurate. So you need to uh, bring into your cat labs or, or our hybrid suit a generator that is going to provide 20 to uh, 25 volts to the left ventricle, just to be able to, to be sure that you, you can stimulate the left ventricle. Uh, some devices are uh, under investigation, so I'm not going to focus too much on, the, uh, on that. If you want to uh, get more details about LV wire stimulation, you can access this uh, uh, tutorial on the uh, PCR online website. So one thing that has um, changed uh, in our practice, uh, in the past, we used to put a needle at the skin of the patient just to uh, serve as the uh, a metallic uh, surface interface between the uh, crocodile clamp and the skin of the patient. Now, as you can see directly, you can put the clamp at the skin of the patient. You just have to, uh, when you, uh, once you've done your, punct your puncture and you generate the hole that is going to house the uh, large ball shift, make it slightly larger, and then you can clip your uh, crocodile clamp directly at the skin and it works and it's uh, safer for you because you don't have that needle. And so the, the risk of uh, inadvertently puncture your fingers during the procedure. So very simple trick that make, can make it safer uh, for you. So uh, sometimes it's uh, it's quite difficult to um, have uh, a nice uh, stimulation of the left ventricle, even though you have the uh, insulator, you have the right contact with the left ventricle, you have enough energy, it doesn't work. And you, here you can see that's something that we used for a, a balloon expandable platform. If you want to make sure that you're going to simulate, you just you can use that simple trick. Just scratch, scrap the surface of the distal portion of the left ventricular wire. Just erase, withdraw part of the coat of the coating uh, all around, let's say one centimeter of the wire, and this is going to put into contact the metallic ends of your crocodile clamp and the metallic core of the wire, and this is going to it's not 100%, but it's more than 99%. This is going to help you stimulate accurately at the left ventricle. So this is something that you can do. And even if you have to bring back and forth with catheters on the wire that has been scrapped that way, this is not harmful for the patient. We didn't experience any major issue when we, we, we did that. Even if for a post dilatation, for, for example, you can use the same wire. So this is um, uh, just uh, as you were in the, in the cat lab with us. This is uh, something that we do because we, what, when we work, we want to avoid to uh, uh, push, pull the wire, the left ventricular wire uh, to, uh, in contact with the apex. So we keep it at the apex and we try to minimize the movement of the curved portion of the wire with the apex. So the thing is really when we do the exchange of catheters and so on, uh, we do that kind of, uh, curve. So you just make a fixed point with your left hand on the wire and it's just about uh, bringing, uh, disconnecting uh, the wire into uh, two parts, the part that is into contact with the left ventricle that is not going to move. And then you make bends with your right. And 
push pull uh, as we used to for coronary stuff when we do the exchange uh, you use both ends and you kind of uh, do a seesaw movement at the apex of the left ventricle and this may prevent the risk of uh, perforation for your patient and it's very easy after uh, when you need to advance anything just to uh, uh, extend the to straighten the, the bands that you've done and this is more stable in our practice and avoids that first to withdraw the wire and second to do these tiny seesaw movements uh, in contact with the apex of the left ventricle. So uh, the last uh, trick uh, that I wanted to, uh, to share with you is sometimes it's quite difficult to, uh, uh, to cross with the, uh, the valve because uh, we have a, you know, a bicuspid valve, for example, an horizontal aorta, or extremely calcified valve. So uh, very simple tricks. Um, it requires it's an additional access. It requires a second large ball shift just to get to bring a balloon, but you can use the body balloon if you are unable to cross the aortic valve. And so you need to bring a, for example, uh, depending on the balloon that you use between uh, nine and 12 French shift on the contralateral side, I would put a, a, a second femoral access. You cross the valve and you can, use only the balloon as a without inflating and try inflating it and trying to cross like that if it doesn't cross you just inflate the balloon it can be a small balloon for example an 18 millimeter balloon or even smaller and uh, most of the time the deflation of the balloon help makes it easier for you just to by some kind of uh, venturi venturi like effect uh, really swallow uh, the the prosthesis towards the left ventricle and help you across so this is uh, probably a more advanced trick, but something that you need, we need to keep uh, uh, keep into to have into to keep into consideration because sometimes, most of the time, we go uh, for a direct IV procedure, and we from time to time may have to face this situation. So we need to know how to get rid of that. So uh, I don't have any uh, take home message because it's uh, all about first uh, continuous learning and I'm continuing to learn because when I attend uh, see live cases, I attend uh, cases with uh, all our friends, uh, all the, the, the cardiology community. I always pick some things that I can bring and implement into my, my practice. And it was quite funny because when I, uh, we did some kind of um, advertisement for this uh, lecture, we had so many tips and tricks provided, golden tips and tricks provided by uh, highly experienced operators uh, that I couldn't put all of them. If you want to get access, you can um, get to that thread on, the, on, the, on Twitter. But really the, the main message is continue to learn, share your tips uh, and tricks with your peers. It's always, uh, it's very important for our patients. It's very important for us to improve our skills and to make it safer for the patients. Uh, we have to continuously uh, learn and we have to uh, continuously share tips and tricks as, as much as we can, even if we are facing difficult times uh, with the uh, COVID-19 situation. Let's use these webinars, let's uh, share cases uh, among peers just to continue uh, to learn. So uh, thank you for your uh, attention and um, we, uh, we, may have, we may have a little chat uh, if, uh, if you want. Thank you, Azim. Excellent, Didier. Merci beaucoup. Um, that was fantastic. Uh, lots of tips and tricks. I like Fadi's, Fadi's one, but not drinking the night before. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I always follow that one, but anyway, I try to do my best. Uh, those are great. We have an awesome panel on as well. Uh, there are a lot of people who joined who are friends, so I'm going to ask them to put their videos on as well um, to contribute. I saw there's, you know, there's uh, Philippe, um, Antonio, Darren, uh, Matthias, because I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for all of us to, to share our tips and tricks that can help uh, our patients. So, Matthias, anything you want to add? You're on mute right now. Hello, Hello Asim. Asim. How, How are, are you? you? Hello, Hello dear. Hi, nice, nice to see, see you. you. Hi. Uh, I, I was, was impressive, impressive about, about the first tip that uh, the, the toilet, that, that is the scratch, scratch the needle to be more uh, visible in the echo. Because, because I, I, I always have the problem to see the needle in the echo. So thank you, Didier. I will use in my next case this tip. Um, 
uh, after that, that uh, I, I have heard a lot of, of uh, nice uh, tips and, and tricks, tricks, but uh, I would like, like to add one. Um, it, it depends on the device that you use. Uh, in my case, um, sometimes we use accurate. And, and when, when we use aggregate, we try to perform all the procedures by the same access. Um, have you seen maybe in a, in, a, in a Twitter or something like that? We puncture the sheet, the valve of the sheet, and we put the valve uh, by this uh, sheet and also uh, the collateral access by the same large bore sheet. Uh, you can use it with the... Uh, um, the, the, the lotus sheet, sheet that, that is the uh, ice lip sheet, 15 French or also 14 French. That, that is another nice trick that, that uh, is safe that, uh, because you are not using uh, the collateral femoral side or you can use the radial uh, puncher for um, cerebral protection, protection device. That, that is, is all it I, I, I want to add. add. So that's a very uh, nice uh, trick, and I uh, did it from time to time. So my uh, question for you, uh, uh, do you have any recommendation in terms of minimal diameter of the vessel, uh, just to be sure that you're going to accommodate the valve, the delivery catheter? And uh, I assume that it's a five French uh, a pigtail that you use for the uh, contralateral angiography, for the angiography. So what is the minimal diameter the, uh, of the vessel that you would recommend? Is, is it five, a little bit uh, larger, six, seven? What is your... Uh, your guidance on that? Uh, we, we usually use a five French, five French uh, catheters uh, inside of the, of the same sheet. But in terms of the diameter of the vessel, if the sheet goes for this vessel, if the diameter 5.5, uh, suppose that the femoral artery 5.5, you can uh, fit um, ice leave 14 French. You can, can use it and you can, can pass, pass the valve and also the catheter inside. And in terms of safety, because uh, my concern using that technique is the safety of the patient, if it's as safer as uh, using contralateral access, uh, we have um, find that uh, it's, it's, uh, we have uh, see and compare uh, 55 patients using that technique versus 55 patients using uh, contralateral access. And obviously, it's a, it's a small, small uh, number of patients, but we have not uh, had any uh, safety concerns. Excellent. Yeah. This is a nice trick. It's nice a great trick. trick. I mean, I, although I haven't done that yet, Matthias, but I have done <laughs> in patients who have very tortuous um, iliacs or <clears throat> and where I can't use the radial. I've done an ipsilateral lower puncture with a with a <clears throat> a smaller sheath, like a five French sheath, and put my pigtail from there, and then use that sheath also to do a final angiogram of my puncture site. Um, so particularly when there's marked tortuosity, that can also be really useful. Um, Darren, come on, share some tricks with us, Darren. Are you guys? Are you guys? Good to see you. That was that was a great talk. Well done. Hi hi. Um, yeah, if I was going to add something, I think I would, I would add using the CT scan. The preoperative CT scan gives us so much more information maybe than we use. Um, so what would, I, what would I suggest? Well, first of all is have a look at the aorta and particularly the arch on your CT scan before you, uh, before you do your case. Maybe it'll change the, the type of system you use if you've got a shaggy aortic arch. Maybe it'll change your vascular access. Maybe it'll, uh, it'll push you towards using embolic protection. Um, if you've got a difficult case or difficult aortic route, sometimes um, coming up with a crossing angle. So the CT scan, of course, we all go into, the, go into the cath lab armed with an angle that we're gonna deploy the valve. But sometimes you can have different angles, for example, for, for crossing the, uh, the aortic valve where you separate the calcium. Uh, that tends to be in an, a slightly iliocranial position. Or indeed, having a, uh, if you're doing a bicuspid or somewhere where you've got a very relevant piece of calcium, putting that piece of calcium on the side so you can see what happens to that piece of calcium when you do a predilatation or, 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 or uh, uh, an implantation of a valve. So I would say using that CT scan a little bit more, more than just 
what is the size, what is the implantation angle. Um, I think that's a, a good trick and certainly something I've started to do a little bit more frequently in my practice. That's awesome, Dan. Great tips and tricks. Uh, Sachin, thank you for joining us. Um, you got a, any tips and tricks you can share with the, with the group? Thank you, Azim. Uh, thank you, Didier. A wonderful uh, presentation. Um, uh, I, I agree with uh, Darren's thoughts. Uh, my thoughts exactly the same using the CT. Uh, and also, I think going forward, uh, patient specific anatomy and patient, you know, not just anatomy, but clinical features to decide which valve to use. Uh, you know, for example, if there is a small annulus, then, you know, we all know that we can obtain a larger EOA and lower gradients with a self-expandable valve and sort of, uh, you know, weighing the, you know, pros and cons of one valve versus the other uh, patients with coronary disease, previous multiple, you know, interventions, you know, maybe, uh, especially if it's a larger annulus, then choosing a balloon expandable valve for ease of coronary access down the line. So I think these are some of the things that, uh, you know, we are starting to use and, uh, you know, uh, patient specific features, uh, anatomic and clinical to decide which valve is best suited uh, for, for each individual patient. Thanks, Sachin. Thank you, Azim. Antonio and, and Patricia, Antonio, you've always got some new tips and tricks to share with us. <laughs> Still mute, Antonio. Congratulations, Didier. I really enjoyed the, the explanation on puncturing the femoral with uh, ultrasound. For us, that we puncture femoral for 30 years without, it's very important to have the humility to understand that with ultrasound, you do a better job. So this is my main message. Even if you are successful for 30 years, there is still way to improve. There is still way to improve. My suggest, my tips, uh, um, when you have difficulties to cross uh, with the balloon expandable, the body balloon is fine. But before trying the body balloon, I inflate just the tip of the balloon. Of course, just the tip, not the valve. But you put a little bit of chubby on the tip, then uh, you may cross the valve. It doesn't always work, but giving a very low pressure, just manual, a little bit of the tip may cross. Uh, the other uh, tricks, sometimes when you do a, a degenerated a surgical valve, it's time consuming to cross this, and this is so depressing. I use an eight French guiding catheter, coronary guiding catheter. That stiff, uh, big uh, guide is more stable and may help uh, to cross quicker. You always cross, but may help to cross quicker. Maybe you can cross uh, through the uh, puncture, the atrial septum, and then go. Oh, yeah, uh, but that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, good for case report. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it never happened so far, but I don't do as many valves as Didier. Uh, Didier, did you ever have <laughs> yeah. in your career not to cross uh, an aortic valve? Yeah, yeah, I, I do agree that uh, I did it maybe five times. I had to oh, go wow. uh, through a transeptal access and to go the integrate. It's really easy to cross integrate, and that's something also that we have. Uh, to 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 get it, we need to uh, to to have into our toolbox. Be able to do a safe transept aperture as a structural operators, whether it be a interventional cardiologist or surgeon. Okay. That's something that we need to uh, to get because it's really important to uh, to achieve that. Uh, yeah. So I it, we uh, there was a question on uh, proglide versus uh, manta, uh, and the question from the audience was about uh, one of our colleague was about uh, is there a different uh, puncture location. Uh, uh, when you have a proglide or a manta. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have a, any uh, comment on that, uh, but based on our experience here in, so, uh, in Toulouse, I would say that uh, we tend to do the same, to get the same uh, uh, location for the puncture. Uh, let's say more than, or at least 10 millimeters from the femoral bifurcation, 
and or the uh, external hardiac just to make sure that we can compress the vessel or keep it safe for the patient without any major risk of retroperitoneal <coughs> bleeding. Uh, but when we are using a manta, we really try to, to avoid to be too, too close to the femoral bifurcation because sometimes when you deploy the, uh, the plug, uh, this may obstruct the bifurcation. It's really challenging to get, uh, to get rid of that and to handle that. So I would say if you decide to go for a manta closure, go really in the mid portion of the anterior of the common femoral artery just to, uh, to have an additional safety net for, for your patient. Then in terms of uh, uh, results, clinical results, it's the same. It depends on your, your experience, but I would say even more important to be perfectly a target for the puncture with the manta. And so Antonia and Didier, you know, one, one of the things, tricks I do when I want to cross a bioprosthesis and I've tried pecking and I've tried sliding and I'm struggling is what you need to do is you need to change your angle of attack to the valve because often it's so eccentric. So what I take do is I take a EBU guide catheter, like a 3.5 uh, EBU guide catheter or an XB guide catheter. And I put two wires inside of it. I put an exchange length hydrophilic wire that I'm going to use to cross. And I put the back of a stiff wire. And I use the back mm. of the stiff wire just to open and close the EBU and change the angle of approach. And I've had so much success with it because often I've been struggling for 20 minutes. And when I change to this, I cross in two minutes. Um, so think about that. And then once you have the exchange length wire in, I then take a multi-purpose four French diagnostic catheter or a pigtail four French that's longer than the guiding catheter, like 125. And I advance that into... Um, into the ventricle and, and then exchange for my um, for, for my safari. But just being able to change the you know the curve on your EBU almost makes it a steerable guide catheter and allows you to change your angle of approach. So try that. That's a very time. a very very nice trick. I'm going to try it uh, try it next time. <laughs> very nice, Azimi. You learned this from the coronary. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> exactly. I learned it from from radials and EBU putting EBU to the ray from the left radial. Asim, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you know, know uh, Oscar Mendes. Oscar Mendes uh, always cross the valve with a pigtail and uh, she shape wire. wire. And, uh, it's hundred percent effective crossing the valve with a pigtail. Oh, really? Every valve, every valve. I have, I have learned from, from him. him. Wow, uh, yeah, I'm not as uh, we're clearly not as good as him. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, you, you've been very quiet. Come on, share some tips and tricks with us. Okay. You're mute, Bernard. <laughs> you still on mute, Bernard. Yeah. There no, you go. Way. But my best trick was I just uh, get Antonio working with me, so uh, now I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Didier. I, I really like very much. Uh, maybe two things I do, I, I, I really like to do the stupid things. Uh, one, uh, the uh, orthography, uh, uh, the preliminary uh, orthography, we, we pack the pigtail in the uh, non uh, coronary cusp and the amplats too in the left uh, cusp. So you need five cc one side and three hand uh, cc on the, in the amplats, which is already there, ready to cross the valve. And you have perfect view of all the three uh, cusps. So you, you say if you have eight cc total and not 15, which maybe you, you <clears throat> may have to use. And the second thing is, uh, well, with Antonio, we said already uh, uh, many times, I always exchange uh, uh, with the stiff wire to the pigtail. And if creatinine is okay, I give the 5cc I spared with the orthography in the ventricle, only a test, you know, it's 3cc4 maximum. So I know the dimension and the position of the left ventricle, where to park my safari or whatever wire. So uh, if it should get out, uh, I, I, I know it's not in the right place. It's not in the ventricle. Uh, and this is actually a credit to uh, the two patients, which in 2008 and 2010, we perforated our ventricles. So, and uh, I still like it. 
these are small small tips and tricks I have here from 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 Milan. Mm -hmm. But Didier, of course, you have many more. Thank you. No, no, no. And as we are uh, talking about uh, angiogram, a uh, small trick. Maybe you've seen that through the, the cases uh, from Nicolas and uh, even Jean. Jean. We do use a diluted contrast. As you said, that we don't provide 100% uh, percent of contrast to the patient during the procedures, uh, particularly for structural. We, we dilute it. It's two thirds of contrast and one third of saline. And in fact, then we even uh, decrease the bolus, its 10 cc by 10 cc for the, uh, the deployment of the valve. And then we provide a bigger amount for the final angiogram. So I've been uh, doing that. We've decreased uh, by one third to 50% uh, uh, the overall amount of contrast that we provide to the patients. And I don't remember a acute kidney injury, severe one uh, in the last past, uh, in the past two or three years. So that's a very, so it, it says, it tells us that we need to uh, know the device, know where we, uh, we want to deploy it because the visit Visibility is not exactly the same as you uh, when you provide 100% of contrast. But if you do that, uh, not only for the most uh, fragile patients, but for the, the vast majority of the patients, we, we, can, we may reduce acute kidney, acute kidney injury for our uh, TAVI patients. So a very small trick that we uh, may do a difference. Yeah, uh, we, we do that too all the time. We dilute one third um, of um, contrast in, sorry, of saline in we dilute the contrast. So. Um, there are a couple of questions from the, from, um, the, the participants. The one was, Didier, about using the wire for pacing. Uh, are, is there a difference between different wires? Is there one wire that conducts better than the others? What about Landequist or Amplex Extra Stiff? Yeah, that's a very important uh, question. You need to know the wire that you're going to use. It's achievable with all the wires, but they don't have the same impedance, the same resistance to the stimulation. And I do use the Safari, and maybe the Safari is not the best wire for LV stimulation. So if you need to scratch or provide more energy, it may be more frequently used with the Safari. But if you use the Amplat Super Steve, the Cook Extra Steve, the Cook Landequist, you may, or the Confida, Safari Confi the Metronic Confida, the Confida is the one that stimulates the best, the, the left ventricle. Just if you want to start in a uh, safer uh, way for your patients. Uh, all the tips and tricks that I've uh, provided uh, relate more to the Safari because it's the one, it's my preferred uh, wire, but I have, sometimes I have to work a little bit uh, with it to, to get uh, LV stimulation. But there are differences between wires. And is there a specific output you need to be at uh, for it to work? Because it's sometimes, I mean, 10, 15, 20, or do you need to go even higher? Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, you need to uh, provide at least 20, 20, 20 to be sure that you're going to uh, really uh, engage and stimulate the left ventricle. Okay. Um, then there was another question. Um, it says, how to centralize the valve? I assume it means with the lasso. So I'm assuming uh, the, the uh, Luis is asking, you know, there's some cases where you can't cross with a core valve because of where the splines are situated or something. Have you ever used a snare to help you cross? Um, do you ever need that or do you change your wire? Is there any tricks with that? So that's, uh, I think we can all share our tricks with these uh, tricky uh, situations. And it's more a situation that we... Uh, we faced in the past when we were working with different platforms, a little bit stiffer, we had less experience and uh, we needed from time to time to use a lasso just to bias uh, the tra trajectory of the uh, delivery catheter to make sure that we uh, could cross the aortic valve and to be a little bit more coaxial. So the snare can be uh, put either from the same axis, a same axis or a contralateral axis, whether it be ephemeral or even if you want to change uh, more uh, appropriately the angle, you can come from the, from the radio. So snaring is something that is uh, that works. But I would say that this is not my favorite trick because uh, every time I need to snare, I, I know that there is a cost to pay in terms of stroke uh, for the patient. Right. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I often, what I do is I either change the wire <clears throat> because sometimes a different wire makes you allow you to take a different curve or I come back into the descending aorta, I try and rotate um, the core valve to maybe get the splines to sit somewhere else. Darren, uh, have you, have you had experience with a lot of platforms where this is potentially an issue? 
Yeah, I have, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm still undecided what the best technique to, uh, to try and address this issue is. And very often you end up using two or three different tips to try and get through these cases with these very horizontal aortas. And it very often occurs with uh, when you're doing valve and valve cases. Um, so what I tend to do is, is first of all, do a predilatation if, if I haven't already done one, uh, manipulate the, the catheter on the current wire. Uh, third, third option for me would be switching from a Safari to a Lunderquist wire. Fourth option would be then putting a second wire across the bioprosthesis and using a balloon, um, usually a, a peripheral balloon as a bumper to try and, uh, to try and get that, that bumper effect that pushes you away from the non-coronary cusp. And fourth then would be to use the snare. And the last couple of times that I've, I've had to do this, I've gone all the way to the snare without success. The snare can be a bit of a pain because if, if, if you don't want to remove your, your guide wire from the ventricle, you have to have the snare, um, you have to put it in through the, the sheet that you've just put in. And to do that, you need to have a slightly larger sheet. So if you're, for example, in a 14 French sheet and you want to put a snare in, you need to go to a 16 French, then push the snare all the way up uh, uh, to the level of the aortic valve and then put the, uh, put the, put the, uh, the, be it the Evolute or whatever in so that you can capture it in the, in the, uh, in the ascending aorta. So it can be a bit, of a, a bit of a pain to try and get the snare over the nose cone of the device uh, in, the, in the ascending aorta. That can take a little bit of time. And I think that's probably what DDA was alluding to in terms of uh, probably an increased risk of stroke. But yeah. certainly that technique can change a case that is that is impossible into one that that get that can be achieved. So keep it in your back pocket. That's great advice. Um, so you know, to the uh, participants, the last you know, we're going to stop in a couple of minutes. Are there any last questions that you have? I think now is the time uh, to ask it. I mean, so far this has been a, a really amazing session. Uh, of tons and tons of tips and tricks. Um, maybe one, uh, one other I wanted to ask, um, Didier. So what's, you, we were talking about it this morning, a, a case we discussed. Uh, what's your preferred alternate access if the femorals are really bad and you can't do shock wave or anything like that to use the femorals? What do you use? So um, this is really a hard team uh, discussion and here, so we had to figure out what, what could be the most comfortable for all the, uh, uh, the operators and particularly the surgeons and they, they like the left subclavian access. So we go uh, through the left subclavian and if, it, if it's not visible, we go through the carotid access. So these are our most uh, popular accessory uh, uh, and, access. And the subclavian you're doing percutaneously, right? And uh, st st no, still a surgical, surgical. cut down, surgical cut down, because we are, uh, we didn't really uh, find the need to go percutaneous with the subclavian because it's such an easy access for the surgeon and it's so fast and so safe to secure the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the vessel, the artery that we don't go uh, percutaneous. We didn't uh, find any need for that. Wow. Okay. We, uh, we, we, uh, we did the uh, cases of transcarval access. Transcarval is a really uh, appealing technique. Uh, but I have to say that it's quite demanding in terms of material. And so we <laughs> had to discuss with the pharmacist <laughs> to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a useful access to know, but it, it's quite challenging, demanding. So, um, Didier, I think the normal questions from the, from the participants and the panelists have hopefully shared all their best tips and tricks with us. Uh, <laughs> this was really a phenomenal session. I learned so much. I think all of us here learn something new from from each other and that's always a great way to to have one of these sessions so thanks dda once again and to darren sachin bernard matthias thank you all for joining antonio and patricia uh, thank you for joining and making the discussion so lively so thank you for inviting me and it was so uh, so enjoyable so stay safe and hope to see you soon face to face absolutely stay safe Take care, everybody stay safe Bye. Bye.